Yes, yes, there's something like either 140, 180 different psilocybin mushrooms, too. <laughs> they're, they're in all those variables. Yeah. 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 Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grimerica Show. We're going to be chatting with past Grimerica guest Thomas Roberts, a little bit later, Dr. Thomas Roberts, to you and to me, uh, about his new book, Mind Apps, and we get into the psychedelics again and stuff like that. And uh, Tom will go forever go down as the first Grimerica guest that we forgot we had on. And we didn't realize until about uh, five minutes before the show that it was the same when we went to find him on Skype, and we already had him, and we had chatted five years ago, we realized we had already had him on. So it's the first time that happened, uh, so that's a fun one. And we've got a nice little intro here, with some lazy ramblings before we jump into the show with Tom. We've got everybody's favorite podcaster over here, everybody's favorite interviewer. Graham, my shorts are getting tighter. Dunlop, how's it going, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Speechless. Ah. Uh. What do I say? Yeah, I told you, my shorts aren't getting tighter. My legs are getting bigger. Yeah, that's I did, making my shorts tighter. Yeah, I didn't say yeah. smaller. That's true. This time. Yeah. yeah. So how you been, buddy? <clears throat> All right. Not bad. Going on I'm fast. Not... Should I, t oh, should I yeah, talk about it? Yes. I might as well, right? I mean, I'm going to do it fast. So we'll see how long it goes. I'm like 10 quite, days, maybe. I'm yeah. quite curious to see. My buddy, my buddy Mike, Mike uh, out, of, out west is kind of, uh, are you recording this? Yeah. Yes. All right. Out West is, uh, yeah, motivating me to do this. So is he? Try. Yeah. So give us the details. No details. Because it sounds just, pretty intense to me. Just go. I'm just not going to eat for 10 days. At all. No. No food. Just water and. No fat. Pomegranate juice. No butter. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> not even. Honestly, I, I, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to weasel my way out of it already, but I'm probably not going to make it. But I might. But last you're time I couldn't already go, talking about last not time I couldn't it, go, you're doomed. Last time I couldn't go two days. Like, but I didn't try to do more than three. Like I wasn't. I didn't have a goal in mind last time. But last time I tried, it was like second day. I was like, oh my god, it's a mind game. It's a complete mind game. I'm pretty sure eating food is not a mind game. It's mind. Yeah, over matter for sure. It's mind. So uh, what your do you hunger think, goes away. Like your hunger pain. What do you go think away. the long game is? You know, being able to eat is. I mean, this is going to affect the podcast. By the end, you're going to be droopy and slow. No, I'm going to be energized and feel the no. best I've ever felt. Feel I'll clean. I'll take that bet. Hundred percent. I'll take that bet. I just bumped into Michael here. You're going to be in night. here. You're going to be fucking grumpy. No. <laughs> no, I'm already grumpy. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than this. It doesn't get much worse, especially in the morning. You're a real piece of work in the morning. Between you and fucking plumber, it's like navigating a fucking minefield. Meanwhile, I'm having a good time. I've already done some exercising. I've already done some push-ups. I've done some crunches. I've drank my, well, maybe pro you wouldn't, my protein maybe if you shake. Saw me, when, maybe and I if walk you, in and Graham's just fucking Well, maybe fuming. if you weren't late every day, maybe you'd see me at uh, before I get grumpy. I don't think I would. Maybe you're like I'm grumpy because you're late every day. And no. I, I try, go to try to talk to you and you're not there yet. Baloney. <laughs> That's a farce. <laughs> I haven't even been late in a while. I start at 7.10. Right, exactly. Yeah, I skipped my first coffee. I can't believe you. <laughs> we've, been, we've been successful on the podcast with your tardiness in, in life. Like, that's the one thing you're, you're pretty good at, getting here for podcast time. And picking my kids up. Yeah. <laughs> and my counseling appointments. Do, I you hate tell being them, late. do you tell the counselor that you're late all the time I'm for everybody late. else? I'm never late. And what do they say? I like, don't tell them because I'm never late. <laughs> I got enough shit to talk about. We don't get into my legs. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll get there one day. That's like way down I didn't the list plan of self-development. You know, I didn't plan on uh, bringing that I've up. I've been getting but... better at getting on time for work. I have time to exercise in the morning. That's Actually, great. you know what? I was late the other day because they dug up my shortcut. And I'm like pot committed by the time where they dug it up. So it's like I go the back way around. And so I cut from 114th on the, like, in behind the Canadian Tire Warehouse and everything. And I come up by that new car wash they made. So I duck all the way up in there. And the last, like, 10 feet before you get onto 52nd, they've got it dug up, blocked. Wow, really? Yeah, so wow. you have to turn around, go all the way back out on 114th. Pull back into the traffic jam. I just pulled out of all wow, snarkily. That's yeah, that's crazy. And I'm, like, four cars behind the one I was... Anyway, 
it's a tough route to work that. Yep. And then I got this fucking train to compete with that sometimes starts backing up. I got stuck at a train the other day, and it, it's bad when it doesn't even move, when it's just stopped there, and you're like, so oh, yeah. by the time this thing gets going, how long is it going to take? Oh, yeah. Sometimes they start going in the other direction. Yeah. You're just like, oh, okay, okay <laughs> put it in park. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take a nap. Anyways, enough about our local challenges, Cadillac challenges. Why'd you call them Cadillac challenges? I don't know, because compared to a lot of people, that's, you know, we got a good... First world problems? Yeah. I've never heard the term Cadillac challenges before. Did you just make that I up? I did, yeah. Huh. Not bad. Yeah. If yeah, it was like 1990, it it'd out. be pretty good. <laughs> Nowadays, it has to be like whatever the private jets or some other sort of like Cadillacs no. I don't think are even that great anymore. Yeah, they are. What's going on over there? What's I'm that noise? Sque- chair squeaking. Is that like your legs squeaking together now? Do we have a real problem going on here? Are we gonna have to, am I going to have to intervene? I told you I'm fasting this weekend. Oh, that should help. That's why I'm not going with you on your little road trip. Oh, yeah, because I ain't fucking fasting, bro. I'm eating. I'm off the diet for the long weekend, eating whatever comes my way. Gluten. Be damned. I'll be sore, though. That's the problem. Is it sacrifice? I know that now that I've been off the gluten long enough that, like, when I pile into it it's not bad I'm, i haven't noticed i have just like a little bit you know like maybe like a piece of breaded fish i won't notice that but last night i had two pieces of pizza that were not gluten-free and that's a lot of dough and just fucking i woke up this morning and i could just feel it i was like what what happened what did i do what's changed so you really can feel it do you think yeah. that's everybody and i'm like just trying you, like... to stretch it out and trying to and i just can't shake that tenseness of just going out the back of my head and i don't know but i've noticed it enough times noted that i think i can call it a thing yeah me too i mean honestly since i went from that like till may till cac basically i went pretty good without gluten and sugar and then now my shoulders are like sore like i can hardly do push-ups now so after i've been re- like so relapsed onto all this like sugar and yeah. carbs and gluten and it's really it's been an interesting experience like i'm really looking forward to getting back the other thing it. I noticed was milk because I was like off milk pretty much. And then I got a weak spot for milk for sure. Especially like, no, I wasn't off a of dairy, just milk. Just like try not to drink a bunch of milk. Cause I can just, instead of a glass of water, I'll get a glass of milk and just chug it. I was like the other night I was, I was going home and I was just, I was having a bad day or whatever. So I ended up, I grabbed a bag of chips and, uh, a thing of fucking, a, a two liter jug or a half gallon jug of milk. I drank the whole fucking thing. <laughs> and I was just like, the well, next day I woke what? up and I just had like, uh, no, this was, this was a while okay. back. The next day I woke up and I was like, I just felt like a little, like a layer of, uh, I don't know, like a layer of like just fat under my skin. You know, I had a little gut again and what? Really? yeah, went away in a couple of days. I was like, in, I woke up and I felt bloated. Yeah. Geez, now you made me want to have some cereal. Like maybe I should do that. Oh, before dude, I fast yeah, it's so like good. Sugar corn pops. Cereal. Or oh, no, they, they took the sugar out of the name. It's just corn pops. Now. That's what got me back on the milk. Is there was the kids had some cereal there, and I was just looking at the cereal and the milk, and boom, <laughs> eat a couple bowls of cereal. I'd have to finish the whole box off though, because I'm cleaning my house out with no food. <laughs> So I'd have to stop tonight. Are you going to have box. like an emergency fucking protein shake or something? No. It's fine. People do it all the time. No, they don't, bro. <sighs> people don't go 10 days without eating all the time. Well, some people do that little maple syrup and cayenne thing that, uh, what's it called again? There's the master Maple cleanse. syrup and ma- You should the just have a flask. <clears throat> you should have a little flask of maple just syrup. In case emergency yeah. break glass. They'll think you're drinking again. They'll come in your <laughs> office. You're like, what are you <laughs> Wiping your face off, tucking your flask away, yeah. it's maple syrup. That might help when you're getting grumpy. Then I yeah. might just go rock it right into keto from there for a while. And then ease my way back into the carbs with, health, <laughs> with healthy carbs. Let's start with uh, getting through the weekend without okay. eating weekend. any food. The long weekend. Like the, We're really going to notice this over the progression of the audio book. From eating I gram mean, <laughs> to haven't eaten in 10 days gram. I really got to see how, what happens to the pacing and the tempo and the general 
you know, atmosphere of the book should be quite an interesting experiment. Darren's talking about, we've been recording some audiobooks lately, so just a little side project thing, experimenting with it. We'll see. See if it makes a difference. Oh, guaranteed it is. I, I'll be so I picture focused. you as fucking near death by the end of this thing. How different? Like angry. You're going to be angry. No, not at all. It's what you keep saying. No. I picture this totally different. I feel like we'll this see. is going to be a life-changing event for you. We'll see. Just watch. Just picture you have some aspirin around. Because you stop eating. I know, the coffee. Like I'm going to have a caffeine withdrawal right off the bat. Yeah, and your blood sugar is going to spike. Yeah. Because you're a little heavier now. Yeah. So I'd hate to see you have a heart attack or something like that from the blood spike from the... Oh, dude, come on. And the blood pressure spike from the blood sugar spike from the sudden stop of food. <laughs> I think it'd be good. This should springboard you back into healthy ground. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having healthy ground back. Pretty soon I'm going to be the beefcake in this operation. And then I, everything starts falling apart from there. Just keep doing your push-ups and your sit-ups and you'll get, you'll, you're getting pretty ripped already. I know. That's what I'm saying. I can't have you slacking. I look up to you from a health perspective and I'm just starting to be like, what is going on over there? <laughs> so what do you got? I don't have a jingle board. Oh. I can uh, still play the quotes jingles. Do you have a sinker or something? You had an email to play about support because you guys need to support the show. That's the one thing I wanted to mention. This show comes out Friday. So either by today or tomorrow, by the end of the weekend, we will be complete with our migration of the Primerica sites off of DreamHost and onto our own servers. Um, that, uh, yeah, we're done. That includes a new website. So you're going to see a new website by, by Monday or Tuesday. But when you go to grimerica.ca, grimerica.com, you're going to have a nice shiny new website there you can navigate through. Support options, sign up for the newsletter. It's a little simplified uh, the black budget links there. So some of you might run into some issues with access in the black budget content on the website. Uh, just email me or Adam if you're having trouble with that, and I'll give you the new password. Uh, other than that, the website's looking good. It's loading fast. We're hoping that'll stay the stay the course. We got the store. The store will be embedded there, and all the new links to all our new ventures, like contact at the cabin and stuff like that. So. All that stuff. So the websites were first, and by Christmas time, we'll have finished the migration of the chat. So we'll start running a mirror chat server on our own server right away here. In the next month or two, we'll get that going. We'll run the two of them for you know a while, six months or a year, where we slowly migrate the chat population onto our own server because I trust Discord less and less from week to week. So We'd rather do that now than react and say, oh, Discord got shut down. Now what? This way, you know, we'll run them both for a while, for a year or so, and at least we've got it there to retreat to. Even if we have them both forever, at least we've got something to retreat to when the shit starts flying. Same with our back catalog of audio. We'll upload all 400 episodes to the to our own server. We'll get a separate server for that before Christmas, upload all the audio, and then we will have a backup RSS feed. It'll be in the show notes. It'll be on the website. It'll be in the newsletter. It'll be sort of everywhere. You guys don't by any means have to start using it, but uh, just know that if your feed ever stops working because someone at Libsyn or iTunes or someone else kiboshes it, you'll have our, it's sort of our backup. We'll always have, it sort of a, what sort of a dead man switch, except instead of being, I would ruin the other guy, Dead Man Switch. It's a keep rocking the podcast, Dead Man Switch. It's like, oh, you think you got us? Boom, we're back on. I think you got to come up with a better name, but. What's it? You got one? No. Well, you got to come up with it fast because when you stop eating, your fucking cognition is really going to slow down. No, it's going to speed up, actually. That's the problem. You know, it's it's going to speed up for a while. It's slow right now. Because a hungry person, I think, is probably more. No, it's not like hungry. The hunger is, it's like you're always, not always hungry. Dude, you're always away. hungry now. I know, but that's, you know. But the hungry person is, I think you're better off in that mode. You're better <clears throat> off to get something done when you're a little hungry than when you just ate. But after like day four, I think that starts. No, hurting. then you start to feel great. No. 
Hey, I just bumped into Michael last Maybe night. like a thousand years ago, yeah. And he was here, and he was telling me about all his So fasts. you're going to be having like fucking gluten withdrawals, carb withdrawals, caffeine withdrawals, sugar with Like you're going to be withdrawing from a lot of substances at the same time. <laughs> I'll figure it out. I think we should get a camera on you I'll at all do time. a bunch of can cardio. I put, can I put a webcam just... in the house? No. Just at the D and D spot, no. we could watch you slowly deteriorate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get on to this. I have a I have a synchro and I have uh, a CAC email. If you want to talk about CAC a little bit, contact at the cabin. Absolutely. Well, we were just talking about before the spots. We are down to four spots left. Two of the eight twenty five spots and two of the private rooms at a thousand fifty. Of course, any of those could be made to double occupancy by adding forty percent. Um, but yeah, four spots and that's, this is after the ramp up. So we've already ramped up. We've already added the extra spots that we could add by getting the, we've secured the extra cabin, but, uh, those are gone now too. So there's four spots left. I'd imagine they'll be gone. I would say I predicted by the end of August, which we probably would have hit if we wouldn't added the spots, but I'd say within two weeks, I mean, I've got, I've got more people asking for information right now than I do spots that's, left. Wow. That's great. Yeah. So that'll be sold out. Contact at the cabin.com has all the details there Over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to start putting together. I mean, I don't have all, we don't have it ironed out yet, but pretty soon I'll get some sort of a waiting list going for the next Randall Carlson event. You could probably even get on that now just by emailing me. Well, we want feedback about it as well. You want to tell them a yeah, little bit about what we're thinking? Yeah, I didn't get any feed about that. Well, yeah, we about? talked about it last show. Yeah, we should talk about it for a few shows until people do we have to? Do we have to do the whole thing, like the whole spiel again, like they skipped last show, and this is their first time hearing it? Or can we act like we're just, we rehash yeah, it a little? Yeah, well, probably do a, full, do a full one right now. Okay, you do that. Well, we're thinking of, uh, well, we're definitely going to do... CAC 2020 in the summer, late summer, late August with Randall Carlson again, and it'll be in Washington in the scab lands. And it's, it's kind of going to be between either camping at a friend's place with a big guy. He's got lots of acreage there setting it up that way. And then using that as a home base where we thought about uh, renting a bus, a big bus for everybody to travel around in or vans, or there's also a resort that's about an hour away that we could probably get people in as well. Soap. Soap Lake Resort. Yeah, Soap I've been Lake. there. Nice oh, spot. have you? Yeah. What? You know? I've been up and down the coulee like five times now. Right, so right. I've so even there's looked, lots to do. There's, there's the one there, but it's a little farther away. Skookum Bay or Skookum, Skokium, Skokium, Skokium something. It's not Bay, but it might be Skokium Bay. Anyway, it's another campground just up the road, but it's more set up for RVs. There's not a lot of tent spots, but they have teepees. At four teepees right on the lake you can rent. cool yeah it'd be all right man so it's just whether people how what kind of interest because it would be a group for more of like a five or six day thing i think hey darren or maybe even... yeah and it comes in it's going to be expensive to put together so we don't want to get too far along i mean i think we were saying at the low end it's probably going to come in in the couple thousand dollar range somewhere between two and three grand for the whole five or six day adventure and food and transport and everything else uh, so we're just kind of trying to see what level we can do it at. We're going to keep it at a very limited, probably 24 or 25 spots. So, uh, and we're looking Actually, at... Actually, it might be more than that if we're just doing the one group. We're looking at late August, early September. No. Um, <clears throat> next year. So, yeah. Shoot me an email, com if that's something you'd be interested in. And I, can, I don't want any money. I don't want anything like that. Just shoot me an email. But don't shoot me an email if you're if it's a pipe dream. I don't need pipe dreamers. I need people that are, you know, if you're 50-50. Well, Randall really wants to show everybody again. He wants to do the tour of the scab the lands. Scab oh, it's an amazing spot. Where, where the, it's great. Where the glaciers, what happened? Where the glaciers came through and is that what the, the dry thing? falls is? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it's a pretty cool sites. Absolutely. And of course, Randall will be doing presentations like probably, a, I don't know, four of them maybe, something like that, four or five of them. Before we go, we might even have uh, an event where other people from outside the group can come and watch a big presentation. With well, I think on I one might, of the nights. Like I might thinking, put on a concert if we do it. I'm well, really it, leaning yeah, towards a concert. I, I, I was thinking about that. I don't know. You don't want a concert for like 50 people or even 150. Like, I don't know if that, that's just, we'll talk about it. It's only four grand. For Superman? Yeah. That would be cool if he came. Fuck yeah, it'd be but, cool. 
Okay, let's think about it. You didn't know what jingle it is, do you? I had an email about cat that I was going to use. Oh. Yeah. It's the profound quote After the quote. Me. Then we'll wrap it up. Can you guess the human who spoke it or wrote it down? Okay. Profound quote of Okay. Is the next show Skype or Zoom? Okay, you might get the... I don't know. I'm waiting for an answer. We still don't even have a confirmation? Yep. He's going to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you might get you might get a couple of these uh, these quotes here. This is kind of suited to, to Dr. Robert, Dr. Thomas Robert. I think it's obvious that psychedelics are demonized and illegalized by our society because somewhere in our society are controlling minds that realize that these substances have the potential, have the power to unpick the controlling hierarchy. Chomsky. Oh, come on. <laughs> Graham Hancock. Ah, oh. that's from fingerprints of the gods. So this one, what happens on DMT is a troop of elves smashes down your front door and rotates and balances the wheels of the athletes after death vehicle present you with the bill and then depart it's completely par paradigm shattering i mean union with the white light you could handle an invasion of your apartment by jeweled self-dribbling basketballs from hyperspace that are speaking in demonic greek is not something you anticipated and could handle terence mckenna sometimes people say is dmt dangerous it sounds so crazy the answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. Terrence McKenna. Yes. <laughs> we should just go down that rabbit hole right now. Go for it. I'm waiting for you to do it. Uh, you'll spot me. You'll chaperone that one. Oh, well, yeah. All right. Maybe next week. Maybe not on a Wednesday. Maybe we'll wait till you're eating again. <laughs> you have to pick me up. Those were quotes from the Octopus of the Global Control. Nailed it. Yeah. All right. Let's hear some uh, quotes. All right. So Not uh, quotes. Uh, CAC, this is an email from listener. CAC emails. Please keep me quasi anonymous. If you read this on the show, thanks. Hey, guys. Great show the last six weeks. I'll be subscribing via Patreon this evening. It's long overdue, but I'll make good on my karmic debt. My karmic debt with some of the one timers down the road. I want to thank you guys again for hosting Contact at the Cabin 2019 this year, as well as Randall and Jane, Alan, Brandon, Cameron, and the Snake Bros, and everyone else who attended. It was quite the experience. Flying hundreds of miles to meet up with people I don't know at all, and yourselves, who I'd only know as voices in my head, was uh, a maybe far... Maybe I did read this one. Was a f no, I don't think I read this all one. All right. Was a far jump out of my comfort zone. I can imagine it was a greater leap of faith for you guys yeah, to put together right and attend, not to men. Not to mention the drive, gorgeous as it is, but I digress. Yeah, 100%. Okay, I'm reading it again. Okay. C5 setting with Graham and Jane on the full moon, listening to Randall discuss geological phenomenon, especially sacred geometry, and some serious shamanic breathing with Brandon were just a few of the highlights from the first trimester this year. As all this to say, it turned out to be quite the event, and Darren was right. I would have regretted not attending. And he says, C pre CAC 19 shows. For me, CAC was a culmination of years of reading, listening, and questioning the world we all find ourselves in to better navigate wherever my path leads me. It was a milestone on the journey, and I found some of my fellow travelers. Now to the point, Darren, I'm in for 2020. We'll get details hammered out in a bit. Fellow Grimericans, you are all stellar. Future Grimericans, support the show because you love the show. For a price of a $1 latte a month, you can do your part to keep this train rolling. That's all I got for now, guys. My best to you and yours. Until next time. Do I have them on? Oh, I do. Okay, good. Making sure I had them on the spreadsheet, which is rapidly filled up. Uh, okay, I'll do a little synchro, too. You got synchro? Yeah. All right. Want to sing the synchro jingle alive, loud for me? Contact at the cabin.com. All right.
<laughs> hey guys, I just started listening to your show. Love it. Here's my synchronicity. My wife and I met in Juneau in 1999 and decided to get married shortly thereafter. My wife is from the village of St. Paul on the island of the same name in the Bering Sea. You should look it up online for reference. We decided to fly there and meet her family and visit for a bit of the summer of 2000. While there, we made plans to hike to the highest point of the vol volcanic island and she invited her best friend. She encouraged her friend to invite a guy and make it a double date of sorts. Her friend did, and at the anointed time, we all loaded up in a truck and drove to a good spot to begin the short hike. The guy and I introduced ourselves. We seemed to be about the same age, and I noticed right away he had a northeastern accent. I am from Maine, and it turns out so was he. A bit more chatting, and we soon realized that we were in the same graduating class in high school. <laughs> In fact, we went to the same 350 student high school in coastal Maine in the 1990s. Neither of us recognized the other, though we knew many of the same people. He was on the island studying marine wildlife as a biologist, which is a common occurrence here. We had a good hike. We went our separate ways, and I never heard from him again. I can't remember his name. I later reconnected with another classmate who recently went to a class reunion. I told him the story and immediately recognized the person I described. Cause he was, since he was at the reunion too, but I'll never remember his name. That guy should have married my wife's friend. My wife and I have been happily married for 19 years now. So pretty bold assessment. <clears throat> yeah. You ever bumped into somebody from across the world that you knew from a past? I ran now? into to, uh, this Terry guy, Terry Bowman. I used to date his sister back in high school. <laughs> I ran into him at like the Dairy Queen. Crushing some burgers one day, does that count? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, oh, you know, one time I was uh, I was actually driving back from from Red Lake to Calgary, driving straight through, and I'm like, I'd been partying for a couple of days, and then it's like I would always leave at night, so like because it's like 18 hours, so it's like then when you're starting to get tired, the sun comes up, helps you through that last bit, and I was just like, I got to like. Uh, I want to say it was out past Brandon, Verdon, Manitoba. It's like not quite halfway. Anyway, and I'm like, oof, I've made a huge mistake. It's like, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make it. I'm going to have to pull over someplace, sleep for a few hours. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, I'll pick up a hitchhiker. I see someone hitchhiking off in the distance. I was like, I'll pick, pick up a hitchhiker. Like, keep me awake. Keep me company. They can drive? Well, I wasn't <laughs> planning on that at the time. I was assuming I would drive and they would just talk to me. So I pull up to my buddy, Jimbo Kimokabo <laughs> that I went to high school with. He's at a hitchhike and he's going to BC. So within like 20 minutes, I'm like, you want to drive, man? And then he drove, I slept. I dropped him off from Calgary and I've never seen him since. That's hilarious. Maybe he wasn't even there. It could have all been yeah. an elaborate dream. It was actually yeah. just some yeah. sketchy dude that yeah. raped me. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Vancouver. I was visiting my mom and my sister. This was after, uh, like, year, this was years ago, but years after I was in recovery in, in, in Bowen Island near Vancouver. So we're sitting across the table from this guy that I went to treatment with, right? And I was like, is that the guy? There that Everybody thought he was a counselor, but he wasn't. But it's funny because people thought the counselor was his client, and people thought he was the counselor, and he was the client. And I think he stole my shades. You ask him? No, I was chicken. Oh. So I'm there, I'm there visiting my mom and my sister again, and who do I see again when I'm there? I think it's three times now, and I don't go back there very often to that lower mainland. Maybe the universe is and giving I'm you a chance to fucking man up and ask for your fucking sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> Weird, no. eh? Maybe you're just bumping in the same person. Maybe like that. you guys are supposed to get married. <sighs> or he's supposed to marry your sister. No, he's, he's, no. No. No, it's not like that. <laughs> uh, I guess? got more emails I want to read, but we'll see. We can do one more. No, next we week only we have, have like to, eight Next minutes. week we got to pop out a second one, so we okay. got to let it, we got to go. We got an interview in eight minutes, so we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, enjoy the chat with Thomas, though. He's a fantastic guy, friend of the show, and uh, this chat does not disappoint. Enjoy.
right. So tonight we've got Thomas B. Roberts, the PhD, PhD back in the studio. He's a professor emeritus at Northern Illinois University and a former visiting scientist at Johns Hopkins. And he's the co-editor of the Psychedelic Medicine and author of Psychedelic Horizons. He's, he's wrote a few books and he's actually been on the show before back. And we just realized it was so far was back in 2014 when I believe we talked about spiritual growth with entheogens. And we want to talk about his new book out, just came out. It's called Mind Apps, the Multi-State Theory and Tools for Mind Design. So, yeah, thanks for uh, coming on the show again, Thomas. Well, this is what I most enjoy talking about, so thanks for giving me a chance. Oh, yeah, no problem. And, you know, it's funny because we wanted to talk, we wanted to thank you for coming on when we were barely a show. Like, I think you were, Darren was saying you were our 47th show back uh, in 2014, so. I think we had about 300 listeners at that time. Yeah. Uh, three or 400 listeners, so. Thanks for taking a chance <laughs> on us. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, yeah, interesting book. I was. Now well, we have 302. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're, you're listening, you're growing. Maybe it'll make 303 if you're lucky. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, no, we're doing, we're happy with the way things have gone. We're very happy, so. Um, yeah, it was an interesting book. I, I read your Mind Apps book. Um, I think you were probably in the genesis of that because uh, I think we had talked about Mind Apps a bit in our show five years ago, so now it's a, it's become a book. But I think before we get into that, it's probably worth you know, you've got decades of experience in the psychedelic world, and, and uh, you've been speaking at all kinds of conferences for years, so I think it's probably worth just a little bit of a background for people, if you want to go over that, and then we can kind of jump more into the mind apps part. Okay, um, uh, where would you like me to start? Uh, well, biographical I think, or yeah, intellectual? Yeah, maybe a little bit of biographical, and then maybe about how you, you know, how you, how the book came about as well. Okay. Well, um, I was born in Syracuse, New York in 1938, and then moved to Connecticut in 1946. And basically, I consider Storrs, Connecticut, my home. Um, I went to Hamilton College in Clinton, New York, and then worked for a while in New York City, writing some business and financial newsletters, and then um, traveled in the West and Northwest, and finally went back to the University of Connecticut in 1967 to work in the financial aid office. Then I got a master's there in education. In 67, I went to Stanford, and I got a um, doctorate in education at Stanford in 72. And it was really at Stanford where I really picked up my main interest in psychedelics. Right. So I had my first um, experience in 1970 at uh, Lake Tahoe. Right. What kind of experience? Um, it, was, it was very pleasant. Um, my approach to um, psychedelics is not so much artistic or psychotherapeutic as it raises a lot of intellectual questions for me. Mm -hmm. So I was, I'm interested in that aspect of psychedelics, which I think has been underdeveloped um, because it had all kinds of questions come up, not only about what the experience is and how you can use them, but perspectives on uh, lots of different problems and in the book, I try to go over some of the, the fresh problems that psychedelics arise and, and the perspectives that they give us on them. So basically, that's, how, that's my take on them. Of course, most people are now are interested in psychotherapy, and that should be the beginning because it's helping people who are in trouble and having problems. Yeah. But um, beyond that, I'm interested in what they say about the human mind and how we can develop our mind. Yeah. So... If these things can be used to develop our minds, which I I tend to agree uh, with you there, do you uh, do you think they could have uh, played a role in our minds' development to its current state? I think they probably have, although um, I don't uh, hold on the theory that psychedelics are largely res responsible for our cognitive development. Although this almost certainly were had a hand in it, I think probably there's sort of like one tributary among lots of others. Um, for example, every oh month or two, people find some sort of psychedelic um, results in some um, archaeological site, maybe in in southern uh, what used to be southern Russia or northern Peru and so forth. So people are, are discovering that 
our ancestors, as human ancestors, use all kinds of different psychedelics. It would be fascinating to know how the, what they actually thought of them. Unfortunately, there's no, no real way to find out. I wish there were. Yeah, there's more and more of those. I always thought, I grew up thinking there was only a few, you know, like... Uh like peyote and LSD and mushrooms and now, but now in ayahuasca, but now, you know, we're finding so many. No, man, these dudes are finding a way, man. Yeah, they're all finding a way. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, there's an example of people who become interested in um, not only psychedelics, but other psychoactive plants and techniques are asking those questions now about, about questions that have been uh, on topics that have been around for a long time. Like archaeologists are now asking the question, what psychoactive plants did these people use and how did they use them? So this is an example of psychedelics opening a whole realm of questions, people looking at things from a new way. For example, there's some, as you know, probably know, there's some good research now that shows in ancient Greek that mysteries you know, used the psychedelics, but now they're also looking at them in ancient Rome and so forth. So people are, are adding a whole new series of questions they're asking, like, where do psychedelics or other psychoactive plants and techniques fit into various cultures? So all of our sort of anthropological research is getting richer because of that. Yeah. Well, and, it's like alcohol ultimately is a psychoactive brew. Oh, yes. And that's well, just sort of the Western culture sort of won that one out, and they just, like, overwhelmed the fucking place with it. You know, I could see alcohol could have its place in a nice mixture of concoctions, you know what I mean, where it's not just getting abused on every street corner and the pubs or, you know, just like totally not used for any, because I mean, I was actually having that conversation with someone a couple of weeks ago about how, cause I, I haven't had any alcohol in a long time and I can kind of, I can notice now that I'm sort of, I don't know, maybe I'm on the other side, maybe I'm not, but I can kind of look back and see, you know, I miss some, sort of that, that glass of wine that could sort of lube things up a little bit, you know, when, when you have to have an awkward conversation or, you know, what, what yeah. does that sort of add to, to your inhibitions or take away from your inhibitions in, in, in some ways? Yes. I wonder, I want, let's take, imagine our ancestors like 8,000 years ago and they're, they're storing corn and it gets wet and then it ferments. What would they possibly have thought? You know, have first being the first people to taste alcohol, um, it must have been just uh, really magical to them. Yeah, it was probably held with a lot of reverence, like all the other ones. You know, we just sort of look. We, I, you know, it's hard to see that these days, but I could see it as being, as it being, you know, sort of that same sort of held with some reverence, like we see with the other indigenous cultures and the ayahuasca and the. Well, and other things that's like that. kind of what I was going to say is it'd be interesting to know how powerful and and um, important these things were if they were really to have them ceremonially or with lots of reverence like we, we're starting to get to that point now I think with all the you know all the stuff that you talk about in your book all the all the therapeutical uses and the and the spiritual uses but I mean it's taken us a long time to get there but I mean imagine how powerful it was with cultures that took it seriously yeah Yes, you know, and in ancient Greece, they had what we call symposia, which were a bunch of just sitting around discussing things. And they would use um, wine or um, uh, wine and then add herbs to it. So that these, well, we think of now symposia as being a sort of stuffy academic uh, people getting together. At that time, they were getting high on all kinds of different psychoactive plants. Yeah, that's funny. So what, what did you, what made you go from from all this to the mind app and the multi-state theory. Yeah. Well, as you, as you mentioned, um, I sort of, my ideas sort of grow over time and there's no real beginning when suddenly I say, Oh, my idea started right here. But as I was studying, um, psychedelics, of course, then I, I, a question I always ask and I find it worthwhile asking is, the thing I'm looking at is an example of what larger group, what larger class of things. So when I look at psychedelics, uh, of course, then that's the thing is, well, what about you know other psychedelics or what about other psychoactive plants and so forth? And then going from there, what about other ways of altering our consciousness, or I'd like to say mind-body state? 
Well, there's breathing and prayer and yoga and exercise routines and and things that are coming along like brain cranial stimulation and um, all these things that are happening. I'm suddenly realizing that that these are all part of a a large group of the things that I call mind apps. So psychi- looking at psychedelics is one class mind apps. Had me ask the question, what are other kinds? And then, then that's that when the idea of mind app comes in as Rather than just talking about psychedelics, I want to see psychedelics as part of a much larger view of the human mind, one that includes all these other techniques of, as I like to think of, installing mind apps in our brain-mind complex. And, of course, new ones are being imported. Um, Ayahuasca and Ibogaine are are recent examples, and they're being invented in the medical community because whenever anyone discovers something about the human brain, although they don't go in this direction, it's possible to think this is a, a mind app that may have some use in its being installed in our brain mind complex, and we may be able to do different useful things in that in that state. So what I want to do is is, is widen people's perspective so that they see psychedelics as just one family among a lot of other families of ways of using our brain mind complex. Yeah. So that's the big idea in the in that book. Right, and then and then you also have a couple other terms in there that are worth going over, like mind body as opposed to consciousness. So, can you explain why you tried to yeah. simplify consciousness in, into a term like mind body? Yeah, the, the word consciousness is confusing because different people use it in different ways, and I'm I'm trying to specify one particular way that I use it in my book. For example, we, we when we're awake in the morning and we're unconscious at night. We say we're conscious now, okay. or we may think of um, consciousness as being um, a, a self-aware in philosophy. Someone is conscious if one can think and think about one's own thinking. And in politics and sociologists, sociology, consciousness means the thoughts and ideas one has because of one's place in society. And of course, there's Charles Tarp's idea of altered states of consciousness, and because um, the word consciousness is so confusing, and people are talking together, they think they're talking about the same thing, but they're actually using one word in a lot of different ways. So for my specific way, I'm stipulating, when I use mind-body state, I mean something like Charlie Tart's altered state of consciousness. That is a different combination of the way we're thinking and feeling and behaving. Now, I'm not saying that consciousness is a bad word to use, but I'm just saying that my particular book, I'm stipulating, when I, instead of using the word consciousness, which would be ambiguous, I'm using the word mind-body state instead. And, of course, what the mind apps do is produce the different mind-body states. So that those, those ideas fit together. Right. So did, did you worry at all about that coming across a bit too materialistic, like uh, mind-body being kind of, you know, almost uh, taking the metaphysical aspect of consciousness out of it? No, I don't think it does at all, because um, the metaphysical um, experiences, particularly, I'm interested in, particularly in mystical experiences, um, are one of the things that are produced. And we get to ask the question, how does what we're interested in vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? So much how does perception, perception differ? How does thinking differ? How does perception, or how does mystical experiences differ? So we'll get to ask that question of every mind-body state, and this will give us a much wider, completer view of what we can do with the human mind. Now, I don't see consciousness as something that exists on its own, and I'm a little um, odd feeling about that because some people whose ideas I really admire see consciousness as a primary quality in the universe, and I just can't figure that it doesn't feel right to me. And I I'm think that may be a problem in my way of thinking about things. For example, Stan Groff sees consciousness as being a primary quality in the universe, you know, like time, space, and matter, and so forth. Yeah. I just I can't grasp that. Um, and so I'm not against that. I'm just saying that I, it's something that it's like I don't understand the word quantum. It's so basic I don't use it. Right, right. 
So when it comes to out of body type experiences for, you know, to just to put all that stuff, like that extended conscious stuff in a, in a, in a category, like NDEs, out of body stuff, astral travel, um, maybe even, oh, uh, maybe even, you know, certain, I don't, I don't know if lucid dreaming would fall into that, but how, is that how you incorporate that into all these mind apps is that they can all be a part of all of these Yes, for example, we can ask <clears throat> um, what mind apps will produce an out-of-body experience. In fact, I had one during second out of experience once. Oh, okay. so I know that I know that can be had. I was driving along with a, fr- a friend of mine, and um, we were both tripping. We shouldn't have been driving in a car at the time, but <laughs> yeah. we were. Yeah. Um, and I was afraid he was going to run into the car in front of us. Now, actually, there was quite a bit of space. And suddenly, I was projected probably... 50, 60, 70 yards above the car and could look down on it from a perspective. And I could see that there was a dumb enough distance between us and the car in the front. And so, I mean, immediately I thought, what's going on here? And I was suddenly back in the car again. But I've had that experience. So the, the question is, are some of these things that we think are rare or impossible that way because we only look on our only in our default ordinary mind-body state? But if we get into other mind-body states, some of these things that we think are rare and impossible are, are in those other states. So there's a whole way to approach those unusual things that, you know, parapsychological events and so forth, by saying they may happen more often in other mind-body states. And that's why they're so hard for us to study, because we try studying them in our ordinary state, but that's not where they exist, or they don't very often. Right. right. So, so, so this raises the, the possibility that all those odd and mysterious things that don't happen very often, maybe just because they don't happen in an ordinary state. But if we go to other states, we may be able to find them and describe them and develop them. Thank goodness you weren't projected it's, through the windshield. Yeah, right. Oh, well, hypnosis is an example of that. And we know that in hypnosis, people do things that we don't do in an ordinary state. Right. Okay. And for a while, people were saying, well, people are just lying or drunk or something, hypnosis. Now know that those events happen, and we see that they're located in hypnotic states. So some of these other odd things that people are, are curious about or don't believe in might happen in other states. Now, that doesn't mean that everything um, might happen somewhere. There clearly will be things that we imagine might happen that would probably just imagine it. But we really won't know until we ask the question, how do these exist, or do these exist in other mind-body states? So all these areas then become open for research, and people who are interested in these odd and unusual abilities can start looking at other mind-body states for them, if they can find them there and develop them. Hmm. So have you been able to map these things out? Like there was a part in your book where you talked about the connected brain and psilocybin, and it shows that... You know, there's these there's these um, these parts of your brain that show an increased connection um, on psilocybin, which has the potential to actually like increase IQ possibly because there's more, you know, there's more information or there's more um, processing or something. But is, I think is, it helps you get out of dualistic thinking too. What do you mean by that? Well, let like, me get into the intelligence thing. Um, if we look at intelligence, there are a couple ways to look at this way. One is that um, there may be different types of intelligence in other in different mind-body states, and I, 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 we see this sort of when we see coaches getting team worked up, you know, to play, right. or people who are are performers who sort of get into the flow and get things done. Yeah. They, they're getting different mind-body states, and their abilities are stronger in those states. So there, there's a question of how, how does any particular ability increase the mind-body state to mind-body state? And this includes intelligence. Now, another another approach to intelligence is that um, um, a, a person is considered intelligence according to the number of different things that person can do with his or her mind. Okay? The, the bigger the mental repertoire, the more intelligent the person is. And every one of those mind-body states presents us with possibilities of developing those states, which would be increase our repertoire. So we would be able to have different kinds of intelligence in different mind-body states. And now, getting back to our ordinary, 
getting back to ordinary sleep. Um, problem solving is a good example of, of that. And um, Jim Fetterman's work um, from the 1966, in fact, goes back to that far, from people who were working on professional problems and couldn't get them solved, had psychedelic experiences, and tried looking at the problems from within the psychedelic experience. So they solved the problems within the psychedelic state. Now, probably what this does is, um, in in our ordinary state, you know, certain parts of the brain are connected to each other. But when we get into these other mind-body states, different connections are made. So the different connections allow us to think differently and have different insights into things. So that is, that is increasing intelligence by allowing us to increase our repertoire of mind-body states by increasing the connections within our brain. Um, there's, a, there's a, a beautiful illustration of this. I have it in the book, but the best ones are online. It comes from uh, Imperial College in London, where they show two circles, one of what parts of the brain connect with each other in our ordinary state, which ones connect in the psilocybin. And the psilocybin, you see a lot more connections. Now, when I looked at that del- 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 uh, diagram, I got it wrong. I thought, that there were more connections in the psilocybin state than in the ordinary state. They're the same number, but instead of just sort of talking to themselves, they start talking, they, they talk less within this, their own sort of frame, like within um, visual or within uh, bodily stuff. And they start, it was the same number of connections, but they connect to different parts of the brain. And this is a fascinating thing because <clears throat> that, that study study compares the ordinary state with the uh, psilocybin state. But every other drug and every other mind-body state, oh, it's just, it's just every other mind-body state would have its own diagram. So there's an enormous area to look at here. Yeah, yeah. For people to make all these new diagrams. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. Like each state could have its own diagrams and you could start to pick and choose a like a recipe of states to increase what you want, or intelligence yes. at least, or... Yes, that's right. Well, you mentioned recipes. takes me to my favorite idea, which I call mind design. And the end the, the part of the book is tools for mind design. Because for the most part, with some exceptions, people use one mind-body set technique at a time. And one mind... Um, yeah. one Produce one mind state. But we can put them together in combinations and produce new mind-body states that have never been produced before. And for that will take us, who knows? It's a, it's a bit like chemistry, where you can put all these um, chemicals together in new molecules and come up with, with new substances that have never been produced before. Now, most of them in chemistry, and I think most of our mind-body states, are just going to be curiosity. But a few of them, just like chemistry, may come up with things that are going to be enormously helpful. Yeah, and so. It's possible to use all these different mind apps in different recipes. Not only that, but every mind app can be used to greater or less power, like a little bit of LSD or a lot of LSD or a modest amount, or different types of meditation, doing a lot, doing a little combined with something else. So the number of recipes is, for all practical purposes, unlimited. Yeah, yeah. That, that means our mind is unlimited. Yeah. Like what about me- you know meditating on psilocybin or breathing or doing... You know, you can combine yes. all these kinds of things. So, yes, that's exactly right. Right. Yeah. So, did I understand that as the the psilocybin specifically is using the existing neural pathways more than the other psychedelics are? Like, um, I don't know a comparison with with our psychedelics, but in the in the two diagrams, the first one is actually just salt water for ordinary state, and then. And psilocybin, um, different parts of the brain connect with each other that normally are not connected. There aren't new, there's the same number of connections, but they sort of drop some of the old connections and then use them to plug into new places. Right, right. I wonder if yeah, it's always the same ones. Sorry? I wonder if it's always the same ones. Like, I wonder if, like, you know, X13 always goes to B12 or, you know, whatever 
however they figure out where they're going. But you know, like if the same ones always interchange or if it's random somehow, it fluctuates. It's probably, well, I wouldn't call it random, but it will depend on, um, on the mind body app that's being used. And, and that we just don't know. I mean, there's, this is an enormous area to be investigated. And the point I'm, I'm hoping one of the results of my book was to get people interested in looking at these new questions that come along. Like, I'm like there, there's general agreement that meditation and psychedelics go well together. But of course, the different types of psychedelics and the different doses, different types of meditation, and different um, ways of combining them. So even there, the number of recipes would be huge. But anyway, meditation and psychedelics seem to be uh, one of the natural pairs that look, yeah. looks yeah. going to be productive. Do you notice a difference between the natural substances like psilocybin compared to the chemically created ones like LSD? Um, in terms of personal experience, no, I don't. Um, there's a question of, of, of whether um, naturally occurring substances are better to use than lab substances. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm split on that one because I think a problem with plants, of course, is that what they produce depends on their growing season and the water and the amount of sun and the nutrients. And, and so you've got this, this huge variation with yeah. plants. In the labs, you don't get it. So in a lab, you get a pure sample. On the other hand, in the lab, you don't get all those adjacent chemicals that plants produce. But marijuana has something like over 200 and maybe over 400 different plant chemicals in it. And so when, if we take THC, you're just using one of those chemicals. But it may be that there's all kinds of interactions that go on. Well, there's, there's certainly are all kinds of interactions. And so both of these approaches have their advantages. With a lab, you know exactly what you've got and you know how strong it is. With a plant, you've got all these other interacting chemicals that, that confuse the issue but may actually um, be healthier or um, may produce actually different mind-body states from the pure chemical one. So I, I don't see that we have to choose one or the other. Each person sort of doing what he or she particularly likes, but um, to have a complete view, what we need to consider is all possibilities, the, the lab, pure lab and the natural plant. The mm -hmm. natural plant. Mm -hmm. yeah, we definitely... shouldn't omit either one. There definitely could be a synergy between a, the different stuffs in the mushroom compared to just pure psilocybin or something like that. Yes, yes. There's something like either 140, 180 different psilocybin mushrooms, too. <laughs> they're they're oh. in all those variables. Yeah. yeah. I think I only tried, like, one. Liberty caps? I mean, Whatever. that's the one, yeah. that's the one the that we that used to like have all the time. Rampant in Canada. Yeah. Huh. So... So speaking of psilocybin, it's it must be interesting for you being involved in, in especially in the psychedelic, well, the whole the whole movement and the culture for decades, really, and seeing the media creation of the psychedelic narrative like shape it back in the seven seventies <laughs> and eighties, and and now we've come so far that Denver Darren, decriminalized, yeah, baby, yeah, psilocybin's been decriminalized in some. I mean, that's that's a that's a huge start. Yes. Um I'm ambivalent about that. I think that psychedelics should be taken within some sort of social context, you know, health or religion or mm -hmm. intellectual. And, um, what about there initiation? Are some people, yes, yes, some, some sort of structure, social structure. And there are some people that I think should not do psychedelics except under a therapeutic situation. Yeah. And I'm afraid that they will get into doing them and cause all kinds of problems the sort of thing that happened in the 60s. I don't want to see that happen. On the other hand, I don't want to restrict people from doing them. So I, I think we need some sort of social context to allow people to, to try either try psilocybin and other psychedelics, but um, to be screened and see if there's someone who should take it on their own or if they should take it with, let's say, with a psychotherapist. Yeah, that's it. A... Because a psychotherapist can help you through and we don't need a bunch of crazy people running around. Yeah, that's a tough choice because you, you know, or a tough situation because you, do, you know, you don't want to limit people's freedom. They should have sovereignty over their own consciousness in that respect. But it is a risk that 
it'll kind of get out of control. But that's one of the reasons why I think it needs to be. Well, I'd rather have less. that out of control than meth, I think. Yeah, how out of control can mushrooms get, really? Yeah. I mean, you know, compared to the to, compared to all the other drugs that are rampant. I mean, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, like po- how many billion? 76, 68 billion? 76 billion fucking uh, opioids. opioid pills. So, I mean, it can't get much worse than that. I mean, if everybody was doing psilocybin instead, it'd probably be a way better place. The back might still hurt. But having said that, it's... Um, that's one of the reasons why I think it needs to be the stigma needs to be taken off and things need to be re- and that's probably you know why you're advocating so much more research because if we could educate people on the benefits but also the risks that you know in in a in a in a way that the media won't do right now with anything it would be very helpful yeah of course um even if we put out lots of accurate information there are enough irrational people who won't follow it. You know, yeah, yeah, I don't know yeah. of any. I don't know of anything that we humans haven't abused. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm including like money and you know food and I mean, it's just some of us are bound to abuse anything and or everything, and we have to kind of keep the abuse down to as little as we can get away with. And that's that's the problem I see because I do want it to make it available. On the other hand. There are people who will get into trouble using it, just like there are people who get into trouble by abusing alcohol or money or driving a car. Yeah. Humans abuse things. And each other. That's right. That's right. Yeah. We just have to do whatever we can to keep that down and to keep the use, good use up. And, of course, this occurs. Now, when you get into the area of religion, this gets become really complicated because who has the right to tell me or anybody else what I can or cannot do in my own religion. Yeah. So so for most people, most of the time, probably um, psychedelics work all right, but for some people, it would not be good. And yet that would mean bridging on freedom of religion. Okay, so that I think that's the hardest nut to crack. Um, intellectual stuff will be kind of hard, but freedom of religion will be even harder. Yeah. Speaking of religion, we have a question for you from the chats. Is there a difference to you as far as metaphysical versus religious experiences go? Or sorry, mystical um, versus mystical versus religious. Um, uh, um, or there, the, well, there are to me there there are religious or oh, spiritual versus religious maybe. It's, yeah, so, yeah, that's probably yeah, that, yeah, that's probably okay. more of what he means. Okay. Um, yes, it's hard to tell. I think that um, well, certainly there are spiritual experiences that are not mystical. Although I think that mystical experiences, all or almost all, are spiritual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, for example, a spiritual experience could include, um, let's say, seeing an angel. Um, and mystical mystical experiences are defined by uh, subjective qualities of what the person experiences. It doesn't include, for example, being in angels or gods or that sort of thing. So those would would, would be uh, spiritual or religious experiences, but I wouldn't call them mystical. Now, the problem, of course, is the word mystical and spiritual and religious are used in lots of confusing ways. So this isn't a, a nice, clear lying in the sand, but um, um, in my own thinking, I prefer to use the word mystical to talk about the character experiences that have those particular characteristics, either five or seven, depending on how many you use. And to use religious to talk about organizations like this church or that church or some other, and spiritual to talk about a sort of feeling of sacredness that may be mystical or may not be mystical. Yeah, but that's my particular use of them. Yeah. Do you want to talk about? Uh, do you have any questions, Darren, on that? Or I just want to figure out the other hundred and twenty-six ty- kinds of mushrooms here. <laughs> <laughs> the old box people. Um, well, soon there'll be a little. You know, you can go into a deli and you'll be able to choose them all. Oh yeah, we could do a we could do a CAC in Denver, a mushroom CAC. You mind chaperoning? No thanks. <laughs> Do you want to talk about how you, how you you have a chapter in here about um, this psychedelics saving the humanities? Yeah, 
Um, this is something I'm trying. I'm tr- one of the things I'm trying to do is to interest people in psychedelics who are not ordinarily interested in them. So psychotherapists now are getting are very definitely interested. There's no question there. Yeah. Okay. The people in the humanities are not very interested. I'm trying to show them the psychedelics can enrich their fields a lot. I must still get into them. The humanists, humanists in the in the, in the humanity sense are very wary of things that might um, interfere with their jobs. A lot of university people in the humanities are in a kind of weak place right now, and they don't want to do anything that might um, interfere with their own jobs, or, uh, and that's very understandable. But there are, but I'm particularly interested in the fact that um, the humanities, in a number of different perspectives, can use and talk about psychedelics. My favorite probably is Stan Gross through the human mind. And I have a whole chapter on Stan Gross. Mm-hmm. And he has developed a map of the human mind, which I think is maybe the richest one I know. Um, and we can use it to interpret movies and plays and so forth. Um, it's too complicated to go into right now. He sees four different levels with different kinds of subjective experiences on each level. And those help us understand arts and movies and plays and so forth. Yeah, like getting to the, I, I was, getting to the level of yeah. the first level of that is is like going back and remembering through these states, remembering your birth and stuff, right? Or or trauma that goes to before your normal memory. Yes. Now there there's a very uh, hot item where people disagree. Um because when he was first mentioning this, everybody quote knew it was impossible to, me- to remember your birth. Yeah. And yet, Groff kept on running into his patients who <laughs> had experiences that they claimed were birth experiences, and he went back and checked them out. Since now, since then now, there is a professional area called pre and, per- pre- and perinatal psychology. Um, and it's, it's developed basically the, with the idea that um, ne- neonatal experiences and birth experiences affect, a, they're sort of like a, a sub-basement of our personalities. Now, it's easy to understand if we talk about some sort of chemical that affects fetus, okay? And this would include include that. And, of course, when a, a pregnant woman um, goes through a stress, that tress, stress gets transferred to the fetus. And when she has a good experience, that gets transferred. And I suppose that they, depending on the stage of the fetus at that time, it'll affect the structures um, in the person's mind and body. But now this whole area of pre- and perinatal psychology is opening up, largely but not entirely due to growth. And, 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 that's, um, and that's people, it, uh, and that's back to the psychedelics, right? It's not just uh, uh, work work on psychotherapy, it's, it's actually through psychedelics, right? Yes, um, some of our problems um, happen are sort of echoes or have roots in the birth experience itself. Depending on the type of birth we have, we're likely to be sort of oriented toward a certain sort of general personality type. Now, since birth, of course, everything that's happened since birth provides a sort of another layer on it. So if the perinatal birth level is sort of the sub-basement, then our experiences are the basement and the, the stories above that. So it's not it's not always clear, but that, that our birth experiences may give us tendencies to develop in certain directions. Well, I but wonder I our wonder, life experiences develop those. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if I wonder if 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 that'll get us into the past life thing a little bit better and easier too. Like, is there an overlap with psychedelics and people going beyond birth to even past lives? I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence now that even that that uh, that therapy or that hypnosis into past lives, like even recognizing the trauma that you've had in a past life, is is enough to heal certain phobias and things like that. Yes, that's one of the areas that that psychedelics have helped open up, um, because beyond the or more more deeper than the perinatal birth level, there's the transpersonal level, and that would include. Um, apparent experiences of earlier lives. Now, the question is, are these actual memories of some sort of previous life, and what is it that got transferred from the previous life to the current life? 
clearly isn't the body. Well, so, this, so does this mean we have to believe in a soul or mm-hmm. some sort of non um, non material consciousness? Um, that brings up you know all kinds of wonderful problems, which, as far as I'm concerned, are completely open and unsettled. Um, and yet, in, in hypnosis, two people can go back and have or report experiences. Now, the question is: Is this is the person sort of drawing on unconscious um, knowledge and sort of uh, and producing that as and and, and suppose, uh, supposing it was their own personal experience? Or does this is this a real actual personal experience, and how do we go about determining that? And to make things even more complicated, by the way, whenever you get those questions, is it this or that? A way to approach that question is think: sometimes it might be one, sometimes it might be the other, and sometimes it might be a mixture. So suppose um, in a psychedelic um, experience of a previous life, um, it might be a memory of an actual previous life, or it might be a memory plus people picked up from, you know, magazines and TV and newspaper. It might be one, it might be the other, it might be a mixture. And if it's a mixture, then that makes it even harder to think about. But that's that's the position we're in right now. It's an unre- For me, anyway, it's an unresolved issue that is very complicated. Now, yeah. another way to look at this is um, do previous life experiences vary from mind-body state to mind-body state. So maybe there are some mind-body states that are more have more access to previous life experiences, if that's what they are, than other mind-body states. And psychedelics seem to be one. Hypnosis seems to be some of these. Now, what would happen if we combine hypnosis with psychedelics? Maybe we'll get an even clearer picture, or maybe we'll be a more, more confused picture. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. one of the questions we have yeah. to look at. Yeah. Yeah, but I feel like there's enough evidence now that that the, you know that past life thing is is almost a reality, and if if not now, it won't take long before there's enough evidence to show that um, that something is traveling, you know, between lives. Yes, and and for this thing, and that's the que- that's the question, right? And that that's the big question. If if so, how what is it that means that? It travels from our previous life to the current life. And did it have way stations on the way, maybe going to somewhere else? <laughs> yeah. Too? Bits yeah. and bytes. Yeah. It's all bits and bytes. Now, so, Groff says that, that our minds are basically um, able to know and experience everything that is happening and has happened in the past. And I'm not sure about the future. So maybe it's picking out things. Like, not, let's say, old radio signals as, a, as an analogy. Only these would be some sort of old personality events that was able that it was able to pick up and and remember. I'm not sure to go. I find that really sort of. I'm enough of materials to be really bothered with that, and enough <laughs> a speculator to say, let's really take a look at it and find out. Yeah, exactly. Maybe consciousness is just like a. Uh... Just like a virus, just like ancient Agent Smith, it's already in the computers. We're already in the simulation, and we're already uploading it. Just like eking in and out of stuff, and it's just like oh, poof, already here. Oh, that's a, that's, yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah, I'm not sure where to go with it, but anyway, that suggests that there is some sort of nub that gets transferred somehow. So then, what happens when you eat a bunch of mushrooms? What's going on then? I don't have an answer for that. I wish I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think if we had enough mushrooms, we could find out? Maybe. Well, well, yes. That would certainly give us some some evidence. On the other hand, we we wouldn't know whether that evidence is an evidence of a previous life or whether it's our our hope to find previous life calling on things from the unconscious. But or, 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 the, or the or the akashic records or the the thing that Groff talks about, you know, it could be calling up some resonance from from uh, you know the you know the yes, record, so no. yeah. Um, and and one of the things I really like about psychedelics is they allow us to address all these um, so weird, odd, and important questions freshly and try to look at them from, in new ways. And not just to say, well, it's just craziness or schizophrenia or imagination. Um, and some of them probably will be. I mean, that's the problem. 
I mean, a certain, we humans do imagine a certain amount of stuff that isn't real. And so how are we going to determine what are sort of our own imagination generating and what is, in a sense, out there somehow? Yeah. And how do, how do, we, how do we determine that? And what is the imagination capable of generating? That's right. Right. Into reality. Yeah, yeah. You, can't, you can't really um, generate anything without imagination. I mean, everything starts imagining or thinking, right? Yeah. Right. So I got an um, interesting... Oh, go ahead. Um, one, this, this sort of reminds me of the idea that um, in the sciences and social sciences, it may be possible to develop um, a systematic way of developing new paradigms. So this is, this is part of the, the question about both the humanities and the social sciences. And I, I use the example of Benny Shannon, the cognitive psychologist from Israel who went to Brazil. And as soon as you hear Brazil, you know immediately oh, ayahuasca comes to mind. And much to his surprise, he had some ayahuasca experiences, which got him thinking very differently about cognitive psychology. And he came up with questions on how cognitive psychology can help understand um, ayahuasca experiences and how ayahuasca experiences might contribute to cognitive psychology. So in a sense what he did is he expanded the paradigm of cognitive psychologists to start to include ayahuasca experiences. And I think that, that is combining those two is we have to look at it from all our different disciplines. Philosophy especially I think, needs people who are philosophers and can not just think about psychedelics, but have psychedelic experiences and then go back and think about them in an ordinary state. Yep. Um, but so, well, I mean, there, is a, there is this philosopher, uh, Peter Schostren H. Um, in England, um, who is looking at that issue. But, uh, for example, our idea, I'm going to say one of my favorite things to get into is this idea that psychedelics intensify our experience. For example, almost everybody who's done psychedelics has sort of had this experience that thought, this is real. This is really real. This is realer than real. What does it mean to have different degrees of reality? And how is that? How we have to think different about what's real, kind of realize we can crank it up and crank it down. I use the word rheostat. We can rheostat reality up and down. And also truth. I mean, people have the idea. This is true. This is really true. This is realer than really true. Okay. And, I mean, you all know, know those experiences and the same with beauty and same with spirituality and so forth. Yep. So what does this say about our minds? Is there some sort of, I, I, I mean, a sort of as an analogy, a sort of real stat where we can turn this up and turn it down? And if so, then what does it say about those concepts? Um, are they, is truth like something that's given or are there different degrees of truth? And different degrees of reality, different degrees of beauty. And we can start doing experiments on those to find out. We don't have to just sort of imagine them. Yeah. And so all these concepts in the arts and in philosophy are open to experimentation. Yeah. And that, I see, is a real opening. Yeah, and what does it mean when our minds feel like something is realer than real when you're not in your, when it's when you're leaving your body? Like a lot of those examples of people having those, like, you know, experiences of the ultimate oneness or love or reality that's that's more real than this physical reality and yet they're out of body or in some sort of astral form i mean what does that say about our minds when things are real or when you're not in it or they could be yes the question you ask what does that say about our minds is exactly I think, the right question to ask we can just dismiss it and say well it's just craziness and stuff but that doesn't match the experience people have yeah yeah, how do we... So, psychedelics like always require us to think differently about a lot of different kinds of things, not this, just psychotherapy. They seem to shut some things off in a lot of ways, too. Like, it's really hard not to be present on a bunch of mushrooms. You know, you're not, like, worrying about the rent. I mean, that's... A, or, you know, anything. That's my experience of it anyway. It's like, <clears throat> for the most part, you're there. You're in the moment, and you're not... You're not interested in wandering away from it. Or what you're going to do Whether that's, in, in September. You're yeah. You're thinking about, you know. You're like, 
staring at your hands or whatever the <laughs> fuck, you know? Well, down there, of course, I mean, different people have extremely different experiences on psychedelics, too. I'll give you an example from, an example, um, from my class. I taught a class on psychedelics, and the first book I would have them read was, uh, would be Huxley's Doors of Perception. Now, a problem when that came out uh, in 1954, if people read that and they thought the experience that Huxley had is the experience that Messelin produced, but it wasn't. That was Huxley's mind that produced that. And it was a long time before people realized that if they took the same dose, they would not have the same experience Huxley yeah. did yeah. because it was their mind that was producing it. And now we know that. And we've made enormous um, advances because we, rec- we recognize sort of set and setting as being so important. But when psychedelics were first, first produced, first produced, people didn't know about set and setting. Yeah. And so you give it to somebody you have an experience. You give it to somebody else and have an entirely different experience. Not only that, you give it to the first person again two or three times and have different experiences. So what good is a drug that's completely unpredictable? Yeah, some okay. people won't even experience it. I mean, we had a friend in Mexico. I think it was mescaline, it actually. Remember, he eat. went down and had the, did that mescaline ceremony. Yeah. He didn't even feel anything hardly. Yeah. It was really underwhelming to him. I don't have that yes, problem. Yes, that's exactly right. But then again, um, like when I eat mushrooms, I tend to have the same experience to varying degrees. I mean, well, you know, there's a couple different ones. I shouldn't say it's the same experience, but I can, you know, I can fit the, you know, there's probably like a catalog of four or five different ro- roads you could end up going down. And they're not exactly the same, but they're, they seem to be quite similar. Well, who knows what makes them different? I mean, is it your state of being in that week? That's is it true. what you ate? Is it like what how, you, how what tired you, ate that you are? Day, yeah. And then, and then there's the, uh, and then you wonder about things like DMT, where you do get an overwhelming similar experience, where you're completely fucking gone. And is that like something where you're so far gone that you're past a couple different layers of that subconscious mind? So you're getting past experience yeah, to something yeah, more yeah. primal. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't done DMT, and so everything I hear about it makes me. Very curious about it. Yeah. What do you do next I'm weekend? Age, it wouldn't be good. <laughs> well, I'm I'm in my 80s, so I don't think it'd be good for my heart, my liver, or my kidneys. Oh, but you got, definitely to this age, you have to really start thinking that way. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to cross that bridge here this soon, summer. Pretty soon. Yeah, you're gonna it's, get, it's coming. Darren's going to. I watched the, the Spirit MP. Molecule again the other day, and I'm a ball gung ho. Yeah, good. We well, have to document it for the show for sure, Darren. Are you going to chaperone me then? No. Ah. No, no more chaperoning. Uh, no more chaperoning for me. So there's a recent study in the Psy Post uh, that said of 119 participants found, the study of 119 participants found that religious people and those who took psychedelic drugs with religious intent tended to report stronger mystical experiences. So uh, does that insinuate that the relig- being religious itself could be a bit of a mind-body app? Well, certainly sure, sure it would, it would explain to it. I mean, if you start with people who have religious beliefs and experiences, you know, in, a, in their ordinary state, they're likely to influence the psychedelic state. Um, and so also, um, when they're working in, in labs, let's just say at Johns Hopkins, they use um, music that is the spiritual music. So, of course, it suggests um, those types of, of experiences. So another whole direction to go is to use different types of music and find out if, if to what degree people's experience matches the music or, or any other um, uh, input that's put into it. So, the, the, since set and setting is so important, um, and we can, we can change the um, setting very easily. There's a whole bunch of mar- uh, variables to work at. Um, so anyway, I, I mean, it's just, a, again, the, the whole possibility of, of things opening up. Yeah. Or during, and it's, and during their um, preparation, so they will spend time with the two people who are going to monitor during the session. And the people that they're spending with was intentionally or unintentionally suggest, you know, you might have this type of experience, you might have that type of experience, and that will put the suggestion to the person. So it's a complicated and confusing and very, but very rich area to work in. 
So speaking of testing and, and experiments, what would you, if you had all the money you needed, what would be your ideal hypothetical experiment, do you think? Well, if I had all money available, I wouldn't use it for an experiment. What I would do is uh, found a department or college within a university that would study different mind-body states. And of course, psychedelic and meditative and so on and so forth. But I think this is the real area that has to be opened up. Right. Um, and I could imagine a, um, they might have a joint appointment for say, with people, you know, obviously from psychology and the biological sciences, but I wanted to include people from the humanities too, so that they would be able to um, uh, carry information back and forth, both from the joint appointments to the new college and from the college back to the original places. And um, so this might, this certainly would include experiments, but it might be include experiments in philosophy and art and religion and music, as well as psychotherapy. Um, so there would be, actually, almost every intellectual discipline has an intersection with psychedelics one place or another. In my, my undergraduate classes were, were drawn from throughout the university, so I had a pretty good sense of what these various departments might do. The only one I had a problem with were some people engineering. Now, chemical engineering, of course, is no problem at all. But um, in engineering, they tend not to think about the human mind as a variable except for problem solving. So that they all get into the problem solving aspect of, of engineering. But how can I use psychedelics to help me design a better whatever? Yeah. So that yeah. fits them. But but it isn't the same as with you know, psychology or sociology and so forth. But yeah. every department could very well have people in this sort of general college of uh, mind body studies. Is there any specific study that you would you would want to do that you've thought about? Well, uh, yes, I would. I would like to have philosophers get into this. I think they really need it. Yeah. Mo almost all philosophy. It's a philosophy of an ordinary default mind-body state. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think other body states, they just tend to dismiss or not pay attention to. And a philosophy is supposed to be the love of knowledge, and that includes the love and the knowledge of the human mind. And if they're going to study the human mind fully, they have to, dis they have to discover and investigate it in every mind-body state, not just our ordinary state. And experiences, example, too, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, they would have to have the experiences and then think about those. Well, two things. One, try to do philosophy in those experiences, which I think might be fun, but kind of hard, not very productive. But then looking back, you know, how do, what did I learn about the human mind when I had that experience? And how can I use that, those insights to understand more about me and life and human mind and so forth? Yeah. So I would like to start with philosophy. Nice. Maybe we should, uh, before we run out of time as well, maybe we should talk about that chapter in your book that you have about the business perspectives, because that's, that's an interesting idea, too, is actually kind of, uh, you know, in, in a way, corporatizing some of this, uh, this stuff. Yeah. Um, the, the way I approach this is the question, how can we um, expand psychedelics to influence society most efficiently, completely, and then the safe most quickly. Positively, say. too, yeah. Yeah. Now, I can understand the argument of we don't want to turn it into just a money-making, you know, money-grubbing thing. Yeah. That certainly makes sense. But we don't complain if a psychotherapist charges a fee. You know, they, they, you know they're expensive. Um, research is done um, at, the, at universities and they cost anywhere from Seventeen to twenty thousand dollars per subject. Mm -hmm. That's really expensive. So what I'm thinking of is if we had a a business whose service was two kinds of psychedelic sessions, one for psychotherapy for all those things that are developing now, and a third for personal growth. That would include problem solving, religion, um, as Bob Jesse says, so calls it. He calls the betterment of well people. I think that's a perfect phrase that he's developed. So um, people would be would go to the psychotherapy session referred to by a mental health professional who would refer them there. 
and people could um, themselves apply to the betterment of personal life themselves. And there would be there would be um, professionally trained people who could guide these that could guide the sessions. First, screen them and prepare them, and guide the sessions and help with integration. Those four steps would have to be there. Now the question is, would this just turn into some big, you know, General Motors or IBM of psychedelics? It doesn't have to. Um, it could, but that. But for example, a way to get around that would be basically um, it would be possible for lots of people to open this type of, of corporation. I'm thinking of a big international one, um, but it could. But anybody, I mean, the, the psychedelics are not um, patented. And what's important um, with the psychedelic um, is not the drug. It's, that's relatively un, unimportant and cheap. It's the professional guidance that's important. They would have professionally qualified people to guide people through the experiences. And um, it would be possible um, to actually bring, uh, no, to, to bring the drug to market is extremely expensive. Hundreds of millions, and sometimes like almost a billion dollars, it has to go through all these very careful steps to be approved of by the FDA. And every new use has to be approved of. I mean, once the safety of the drug has been determined, you still have to try it out in various treatments and then find out does it really work compared with the, you know, with the control subject group. So this is very expensive to try a new use for a drug. Now, in order to raise that money, you could raise it in a stock offering and use that money to pay people to do the research. So people like Johns Hopkins and NYU and research and Imperial College and elsewhere would get grants to actually do this research. So this would be a way of speeding up the research. Now, MAPS is working on the Public Benefit Corporation, which is absolutely great. I think that's a fine idea. Yeah. The problem is that's for use of MDM day for PTSD. Now, that's one use, but there are all these other uses. So the, the image that I use, the comparison I use, this is a way of raising a lot of money to pay for the research has to be done. Not only that, when you start to sell stock to the public, there are enough people who are interested in making money. They ask themselves, not am I interested in a psychedelic experience, but can I make money in this? And they start to then look at the research that you and I and our colleagues know about. Mm -hmm. And they read all this research that's been done, and they think, oh, this is a way of... Um, of educating the financial banking and insurance industries because they're interested in it for the wrong reason. And hopefully they would get along eventually for the right reason. Another possibility is when the stock is um, for sale, um, require that somebody who buys it, let's say if they buy 200 shares, they have to donate 100 shares to some eleemosynary institution like a school or a, doc or, or a or hospital cast. or something. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so that these are uh, these nonprofit public benefit corporations will end up owning a lot of the corporation. And the the um, analogy I use is we look at beer. There are these big international beer companies like Constellation, Modelo, and, and they have beer like all over the world. And then there are regionals. Well, I was going to say Molson, but Molson is now getting international too. But you understand what I mean. There are regionals yeah. and that, yeah. like Kurds and Molson and so forth. Crafts. And then there are, there are, yes, there are local ones. And there are a lot of individual brew houses, you know, craft brews that are being built. So I'd say work on the same level with psychedelics. There have been like, maybe these big international psychedelic organizations and then some local regional ones. And then also some particular doctors or priests or whoever they might be might set up their local um, parallel to the craft brew industry. It was just, they'd be like, crap, suck it out. Then people who wanted treatment to decide, do I, you know, where do I want to go? What fits in with the way I feel things ought to work? Hmm. So we shouldn't be stuck on just one way of, of offering psychedelics, but have a whole range so people could choose what they want. Yeah, yeah, and, including I guess addiction therapy would be in there too. I mean, there's always the risk Absolutely. of there's always the risk of addiction through psychedelics as well. But I mean, there's a lot of benefits to the therapy. So would that fall under one of the two categories of psychotherapy or improvement? Oh yes, improvement, be, or? sure. Well, well, people who are addicted 
would, um, and it could be alcohol, it could be opium, it yeah. could be extra. I, I would say it could be money, although some people wouldn't say that. Um, would would go to the psychotherapy division, okay, and they would be referred there by uh, mental health professionals. So they would go to see a, you know, a psychiatrist or a clinical um, psychologist. Who said, I think you need this type of therapy, so I refer you to there. Right, right. So, so just that would be their way of Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, I would, we're, I would we're, imagine. Go ahead. Yeah, I would imagine they would be residential, you know, beautiful, natural scenes. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we're losing that battle to addiction. I mean, right now, we're, there's well, other, there's more things to you know. Worse than ever. There's the the phones and the the food and the sex and the video games and the gambling. I mean, it's just it's not even hard drugs. Seventy six billion it's opiate just, pills. Yeah. So I mean, it, I, I can have see this being. Us. I can see this type of thing working. This 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 corporate corporate uh, thing that'll just bring it more into our consciousness and, and allow people to have this place to go. I mean, it's really. I can see in the next five ten years, it's going to be. It's gonna be a huge part for you. Can't keep even the lid on it. The best addiction therapies right now, just they're not. They're like five, ten percent, uh, you know, success rate is not good. So, jeez, I think so. But I think well, some, Ibogaine, Ibogaine has, but but uh, rumors going along around around that. that yeah, it should be more systematically studied. Yeah, it's like eighty percent. I think they say some of those. Yeah. yeah. Now, but there's an example of an area that should be funded. Right. Okay. But you can only be so much money by appealing to people. Uh, although, you know, some people have been very generous to MAPS, and, and they deserve a lot of credit for yeah. that. But there's more money than you can raise just by asking people. But if you, if you think people might be able to actually make money off it, which is kind of yeah. a gross way of saying it, but that attracts people to a field. Yeah, but yeah exactly. I, I'm looking at my computer and my pants. These all come from big corporate stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. I didn't make my own computer or leave my own plot. Yeah. I can't even use Linux because it fucking sucks. <laughs> um, well, before we let you go, I got to read this comment from the live stream. Okay. It's from um, a sure. uh, listener. I don't know how long he's been listening. We listened long enough. I've seen him around quite a few times. It's from Mason Lord. And he says, yo, Dr. Roberts helped me design an independent study with a neurologist we called Foundations of Psychedelic Studies based on his course. Thank you all tremendously. Oh, wonderful. I would help. delightful. And he said I would help By you. By the way, I, I oh, hope go ahead. people will start offering psychedelic courses. That really needs to be done. And they're fun courses to teach, as you can imagine. Yeah. We should do an online one. We could do it on Udemy. <laughs> And he says, I would help you guys have professionals in the mental health field offer psychedelic harm reduction and help chaperone your Denver CAC event. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh-oh. See? Got to watch those daydreams. Yeah. Even saying the wrong thing can start problems. Uh, but they're always fun problems for the most part. Uh, anything else before we wrap up? No, thanks. I enjoyed talking with you. And as I said before, let me know when it's online so I can pass the word along. You bet. We will. Yeah, it was great talking and to we'll, you again. And we'll, and we'll put links to your new book in the show notes and all that, and uh, you've got a page. Oh, yeah. That... Thanks. Thanks. I'm glad. Um, yeah. I'm ha a problem with it is that um, the publisher is not one that has a lot of status, and I'm trying to talk to people who are uh, intellectuals and professionals, and I'm afraid that, you know, I'll have a problem with that. Yeah. So if yeah. You, any links you can be with would be helpful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Will do. We'll spread it as far thanks as again. we can. Yeah, yeah, and let's not wait five years next time. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. <laughs> not even Bye. half that. Okay. Okay. Bye, Tom. Bye. That was a chat. Dr. Tom Roberts, Mind Apps, Multi State Theory, and Tools for Mind Design. And of course, you want to check out our last chat with Dr. Tom. Check out uh, episode 47, came back out April 2014. Tell us about a year in now. That was, uh, would have been 10 months. Yeah, 10, 10 months, months in. Yeah. Thinking about quitting. Wow. Where are we at? I don't know. No. We're still in the spare bedroom yeah, at that time. It's good. I like these conversations where the book makes more sense after talking to the guests. You know, I was reading it and it was a bit hard for me to grasp at first, but I feel better now. That's all right. Way to grasp it, bud. It's been a while since you went Psychonaut, and that probably makes a difference, too. What? Me? Yeah. There's nothing to do with this. It helps. 
I'm trying the other states in that book. For me, it's been just a few weeks. Yeah. Oh, no, a few, couple months now. Been, me and Joey talking, though. Let me go deep. Deep. Nice. <laughs> we got a chaperone. I'm doing big C5 this weekend. Oh, actually, by the time this comes out, I'll be back, so we won't talk about it. We'll save it for an intro. We'll save it? You, are you going out to the medicine wheel yet? No, we might stop there on the way back. In the middle of the night? Or no, you're no, no, camping on out? Sunday, I, this is a double camp night. Ooh, party on. Exciting. Exciting times. Big thanks, Tom, for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Uh, even bigger thanks if you're one of the few people who do choose to support the show. Go America.ca slash support. Head over there today. Sign up for monthly. We got Patreon. We got Stripe. We got PayPal. All those things are great. Sign up for monthly. It helps us pay the bills. Helps us grow. Helps us uh, chase down the mainstream. And uh, do what we can for America.ca slash support. And uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in the show notes. Review the show, share the show, tell your friends about this motherfucker. Uh, Sign up for the newsletter. I think there's only like 500 people signed up for the newsletter, so we could do better there. Anything else? That's about it. Leave us a voicemail. Check out, check, uh, I fix the phone. Me out on Instagram and you out on Twitter. I fixed the phone, the Did studio you? phone. You were going to buy mine off me. It was 80 bucks, and you were like, you were, you were like leaning towards 200. Yeah. Well, you want to give out the number? What's the number? The number is uh, 403 702 6083. Shoot us a text, leave us a voicemail, send us some cash, uh, send us some good vibes, send some good vibes to your neighbors. Be kind to each other. Join the chats. Go to America.ca slash chats. Other than that, thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Think if I sit here long enough, fixed to this green, brown, blue spot on earth, approximately or two Domini, in Domini, my hot drink would turn cold, my hot drink would turn cold, my hot drink would turn cold. around for my shoes Think if I hired a million monkeys and let them mash away on some typewriters They'd eventually write all of Shakespeare's sonnets Maybe then you'd love me Maybe then you'd love me Me and my monkey Get funky Go and get funky now. Get funky. Get funky. Dream sequence. Dream sequence. Dream sequence. You'd eventually roll by on your bicycle, on your bicycle, on your bicycle. songbirds chirping woke up this morning feeling around for my shoes i love you up to the sky 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 dream sequence as you were counting sheep i rode by on some comic relief I roll by on a tricycle, on a tricycle, on a tricycle. That's getting all milk and honey, milk and honey, milk and honey. To be or not to be, that is the question. Baby, woke up this morning and all my blues was dead and gone.
I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Aaron is skeptical about everyone. And don't.